Once you stand with me, it's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. What a wonderful, beautiful day it is going to be today. And you have decided to be in the house of the Lord to start it off right. So it's going to be a great day. It's going to be a great day. Um, I want to, first of all, just say thank you for all those that have uh, wished me a happy birthday. Um, what do you say? Thank you, I guess. You know, I, you know, thank you for reminding me I'm getting older and, you know, all this stuff. So, but thank you and I appreciate it. Today's my brother's birthday. And so we're <laughs> growing up, Shane and I, uh, our birthdays being next to each other, the 29th and the 30th. And so it was always an interesting thing. We're two years and one day apart. Um, so anyway, um, want to read this missionary thank you how many were here for the austins uh the missionaries from papua new guinea that were here that shared what a what a fantastic couple they just uh sent me this message said we would like to thank you and your church for allowing us to be there and to share our burden with with you about papua new guinea uh, thank you for supporting us and especially for all your kindness and gener generosity we so much enjoyed our time in Moberly. Big thank you for the beautiful apartment evangelist quarters. It was such a rich blessing to us both. So awesome. Thank you for, for helping us and supporting missions. Uh, also want to say we have a new uh, edition of End Time Magazine talking about Satan's wrath and God's wrath. It does a good uh, overall um, explanation of, of End Time theology and it's, it's all right there and you want to check that out those are in the foyer on the wall you can get those before you leave don't throw those away share those with somebody okay take those intentionally leave them in specific locations if you're at work or whatever uh, make sure you do that also no kids church today today is fifth sunday we're all in the same space so let's have some grace for those that have got little hands and little feet and little hearts and little minds and little mouths uh, we're just gonna we're just gonna have church together as a family, um, and so I want to open up service this morning by reading for you Psalms chapter 84. This is uh, from the this is the NIV version. It says, "How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty! My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God." Even the sparrow has found a home and the swallow a nest for herself where she may have her young, a place near your altar. In other words, even nature has refuge whenever it comes close to the presence of God. Lord Almighty, my King and my God, blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. I don't know about you, but man, it feels good to be in church. It feels good to be in the house of the Lord today. Uh, we were on vacation for just a few days, but it's like you're away for a few days, but you come back and it feels like you've been gone for a year. And I, maybe that's where I'm going with that, that verse of scripture. I feel like I've been away from the house of the Lord for a long time. It's only been seven days. But I don't know about you, but it's a blessing to be near the presence of God and to be in his house today. Why don't we just lift up your hand, if you would, and just acknowledge to the Lord, Lord, I'm, I'm thankful to be in your presence today. As we enter into your gates, we enter with thanksgiving, saying, Lord, it is a, it is a blessing. It is, Lord, a, a honor. It is, Lord, something that we should not be taken lightly to be able to step into your house to enter into your gates, to enter into your courts, Lord. And we do it with praise, and we do it with thanksgiving this morning. God, I thank you for helping us here today. Lord, let your spirit be in this house. Let your anointing flow, Lord, from the front to the back, from the, from the north to the south. Lord, Lord, help us, Lord, here in this place today. Lord, let us be encouraged. Let us be strengthened. Let us be challenged, Lord, here this morning. We surrender ourselves to your lordship and your authority here today as we gather around your presence, and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Let's worship the Lord together as we
God like Jehovah. There's no God like Jehovah. There's no God like Jehovah. There's no God like Jehovah. Praise the Lord, everyone. Aren't you glad to be in the house of God this morning? Thank you so much for being with us. We're going to take an offering this morning. Our offering designation is going toward our building fund. You know, it, it takes money to make things sometimes go around. Lights just don't get turned on. Water don't get paid unless there's some finances. And we're thankful for what the Lord has provided this church with. So i got a few ushers that are going to help us this morning take this offering and we want to pray a blessing over this we want to pray a blessing over what the lord has given this church if you would pray with me as we ask the lord to bless this offering lord jesus we're so grateful for you we're thankful for your goodness and your kindness we're thankful for what you've provided this church family with the property you've given us lord the wonderful facility you've given us we pray your blessing over this offering that you would continue to bless this church and your people in your mighty name Amen, we pray in Jesus' name. God bless you as you give. Just a few things I want to share with you. This Tuesday, we have prayer meeting. We're already entering July. This is the second half of the year already. So kick that second half of the year off right by joining us at prayer meeting, 7 p.m. this Tuesday if you're available. Please come out and be a part of that. You're going to be blessed because of it. And then Wednesday, July 3rd, we're going to be having missionaries, Jackson and Alyssa Brooks from Poland, joining us. It's going to be a wonderful time. So if you're available and you can be a part of this, please come out. Hear what the Lord's doing in Poland and around the globe. You're always going to be blessed because of it. It's a good opportunity. Good opportunity to come and hear what God is doing. And then we have tea nights still going on. If you do know, July 4th is on Thursday. Tea nights is on Thursday. And so it's totally fine if you come out and still hang out at the parking lot. We just ask that there is no fireworks present here on the property. So if you have fireworks and you're looking forward to that, please take those to your own home or a different location. Just not here at the church, but you're more than welcome to still come out, hang out, see the beautiful view, the sunset. But we ask no fireworks and thank you for complying with that. And then now showing, TPC is going to be hosting the Chronicles of Narnia series over the next few months, starting with the first series on Thursday, July 25th at 7 p.m. Donations are welcome, and there's going to be snacks and food that you can purchase as well. So see Sister Jesse for more details if you're interested in that. And then, of course, our church survey is still going on, online version, paper copy version, till July 7th. It is an anonymous survey, so please fill that out. Make your voice known. 
put your input out there. Church values your opinion, your voice. Good time to share your wonderful ideas. You're like, you know what? I got a perspective that I don't think other people have. I got this wonderful million dollar idea. This is your chance. Put it on the paper. <laughs> Let everyone know what you got going on. So I believe that's what I got for announcements. Sister Susie's going to come lead us in prayer. God bless you. All right, we have our July a prayer focus out in the front. If you didn't want to, if you didn't pick one of those up, make sure you get one on your way out. And often in the month of July, we pray for our nation since it's Independence Day. That's something that we normally do. So I was thinking about what we should pray about each week. And really, the what came to mind was a call to repentance, a repentance um, that goes out, that really moves and changes people, and that people would realize their need to be baptized in Jesus' name. I, I really feel like if we want to see change, and I think that there's plenty of room for change in our nation, um, it's time to set aside the meanness, the nastiness that is all around us everywhere, and a call to repentance is what will change things. It's not in a person, on it's not in any party, it's not in any program, it is in people's hearts changing and going back to the Lord. So this week, as we pray for our nation, let's pray that there would just be a spirit of repentance that would be released and that people would accept that. Then this morning, I have a few needs for us to pray about. Um, want to pray for Jackie Crabtree. She was in a car accident yesterday. She is okay, but we want to pray for her. And then um, I had sent out a prayer request earlier in the week, last week, on behalf of Jackie, um, Bill's stepmom, Louise. A lot of us know Louise. She had been in the hospital for dehydration and some other medical issues. And then Bill's mom, Irene, in California was put on hospice. So Jackie's just asking for prayer for them. Um, then we want to pray for Amy. This is Julie's daughter. Um, who's been having an issue with her lower leg swelling and the doctors cannot figure out what's going on. And so she's asking for the church to pray. So we're going to pray and we're going to ask the Lord to reveal whatever that is. And then we want to pray for Chris and Brian Whitmer. Brian is sick today. And then Chris is having some side effects from treatment. Um, and so those are the needs that I have. If you have something online, if you want to add that to the comments so we can help you pray. And then if you would, let's stand together and take these needs to the Lord. And if you need prayer today, please, I love that in our church, we still will have someone help us pray if we are sick. Um, we're going to do what the Bible tells us to do and, and call the elders and call someone to pray over us. So if you need prayer, you are not alone. We are here to pray with you. So let's take these needs to the Lord. Lord Jesus, you are the mighty king and all things are in your hands. Lord, you are the one who has a cattle on a thousand hills. And we are thankful that we can trust in you. Lord, we're thankful, Jesus, that we know the one who is in charge that knows the end from the very beginning. You are the one who sees it all. And Lord, you don't just see, but you are able to move and change. Lord, nothing is beyond the scope of what you were able to do. There is no boundary that you cannot reach across. There is no boundary that can keep you out. There is no sickness, Lord, that can resist you. Lord, today we're thankful that as we lift these needs to you, that you hear and you are moving. Lord, we ask that you would minister to Jackie today and her sister. Lord, I thank you for touching them, healing their bodies, and providing for Jackie what she needs. Lord Jesus, I thank you, O oh God, for touching Louise and Irene. Lord, minister to them. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are in charge. Lord, you see what's going on in Amy's body. Lord Jesus, you know exactly what's happening in her legs. I thank you, Lord, for either healing it or revealing it to the doctors, Lord Jesus, that she would know, Lord, that you have seen her and you have heard her, Lord. Reveal yourself to Amy in an even greater way. Lord, I thank you, Jesus, for doing what only you are able to do. And for Chris and Brian Whitmer, Lord Jesus, 
You know this, this sickness that Brian has. I thank you for healing him and settling the side effects that Chris is dealing with. Lord, we thank you, Jesus, for calling this nation, Lord, to a place of repentance and starting here in this place today, Lord. Our hearts are open to hear what you have to say, Lord. We thank you for speaking to us and we give you all the glory. You are so mighty, you are so wonderful, and we love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. You may be seated today. Thank you. 
So glad he changed me. Oh 
I don't know about you. I don't know about you, but if you need a miracle in this house this morning, you can have it in the name of Jesus. Whatever you need. Sister Terry, in the name of Jesus, it is yours. The scripture declares that all we're doing is echoing the authority we have through the word of God. That victory that he's promised us. Anything you do or ask in my name, you shall have it. I don't know about you, but I got some things I need to ask God for today. Am I alone in this? Is there anybody else? You need something from God this morning. I want you just to express that right now. And just lift up your voice. Lift up your hands. Maybe stand to your feet where you are and say, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, in your name, I declare your victory. In your name, I declare healing over this situation. In your name, Jesus, we are giving you, God, the opportunity to take dominion and authority over whatever it is that's going on right now. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' mighty name. And that's how you pray. That's how you reach for him. You do it in the name of Jesus. Everything you do in word or in deed, the Bible tells us, do it all in the name of Jesus. Somebody tell me, what's the name? Jesus is that name. It's not a name that we use haphazardly. There's not a, you don't just pull it out any old way, but you speak the name of Jesus in faith. You speak it in, in, in reverence. You speak it with authority when you need to. It's an amazing thing that God is doing. Anybody getting some help already? I feel like there's a sweet touch of the Spirit of God in this place here today. Thank you, youth group, for leading us in worship this morning. Didn't they do such a great job? Very thankful for our young people leading us in worship. It's not, there's a lot of work that goes into what you just experienced and participated in, and I appreciate all the hard work that's gone into this. Thank you, Sister Emily. Sister Carissa, I have I, I, a distinct honor to, to bring to this pulpit a face and a name that is familiar to all of us. Sister Julie Morgan is um, our facilitator for Kingdom Builders at the Moberly Department of Corrections, which is a mile and a half down the road right here. Uh, every Wednesday night, for those of you that are not familiar with this ministry that this church is uh, connected with, um, every Wednesday night from about 6.30 to about 9 o'clock, we meet in the chapel in the middle of the Department of Corrections of the campus set up, and the chapel is literally in the center of the entire prison. And we, we step in there, and we have church from 6.30 to about quarter till nine every Wednesday night. Um, I was there the week before last, and we had, what was it, Brother Mike, about 95 guys. It was, it was pretty packed out, and so the Lord has just blessed this ministry. He's increased it. Our call out is getting bigger and bigger, and, and we just, we're just rolling with it. The Lord's doing the work. The Lord's speaking to people. The guys are connecting outside of our Wednesday night service. They're, they're doing their own Bible studies with each other and, and coming together on Wednesday night, talking about what God's doing. We're baptizing people. How many do we have lined up next? There's eight to baptize uh, here in the month of July. So we baptize the first Wednesday of every month, and we line everybody up. And so it kind of gives us a semblance of order to things. Uh, God's doing some amazing things. And leading the charge is Sister Julie and Brother Mike Morgan. And I'm, I'm so proud of Sister Julie. She is, she's, a, she's, she's, a, she's a writer, number one. So she's, she's a teacher by, by proxy. Uh, and she does a fantastic job in teaching. But there's also a, an anointing that is upon her. And I know the Lord has anointed her and given her a word for you today. And I believe that if we'll just get behind her and what the Lord has already given to her for you, that the Lord is going to speak to somebody here this morning. Sister Julie, will you come? Let's welcome Sister Julie as she comes this morning. God bless you, Sister. Thank you, Pastor, for that. Uh, when he asked me to come up here this, this week to do this, I was like, whoa, what a privilege. 
really is a privilege, and I really appreciate him doing that. But uh, praise the Lord. How about that worship team? I mean, that just did my heart good. These are kids that were in my Sunday school class, and you're watching what God is doing in their life. You're like, oh, Jesus, <laughs> thank you so much. I'm so proud of them, and I can't wait to see through their lives what he's going to continue to do this morning. So praise God. You can have a seat. You can have a seat. Uh, I have to say that as I look out at everybody, uh, it's quite a different audience than what I usually speak to. Uh, usually what I'm looking at is a whole sea of gray because that's what they wear out there. Everybody wears the same thing is gray. And I've come through a metal detector and I'm sitting in plastic chairs. So enjoy your nice comfy pews this morning. But, and it's beautiful to see some color. I really appreciate that a lot. But yeah, things are rocking out there. I, I, I can't thank the Lord enough for what he's doing and how he's changing lives and that he, he's given us the privilege to be a part of that. And so praise God. And so, uh, yes, um, thinking about what I was going to talk about and praying about it, I had several things come to me, and every time I'd go through and pray about it, I always came back to this one message. So I feel very strongly in the Holy Ghost that the Lord has something very special for some people in here that he wants to set free from some things this morning. So um, my text is going to be out of Isaiah 43, 1 and 2. If you have your Bibles or your Bible app, whichever, or you can watch it on the screen. And 2 Corinthians 5, 7. And those are what I'm going to start with. But through my message, I'm going to be going through the passage out of Matthew 14, 22 through 33. And I will follow that all the way through. And if you want to turn there and follow with me through the message, that's great. So Isaiah 43, 1 and 2. But now, this is what the Lord says. He who is your creator, Jacob, and he who formed you, Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, and you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers, they will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be scorched, nor will the flame burn you. And 2 Corinthians 5, 7. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Praise God. Let's just pray over the word this morning. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Bless your holy name. You are high and lifted up this morning. We thank you what you've already done far before we walked in this room. I thank you, Jesus, you've gone ahead. I thank you, Jesus, for the angels you have dispatched and already are at work right now. Lord, I ask you just to bless your word, Lord. Let the anointing flow through here. Cover it, the altars, for that is where you're going to set some people free this morning, Lord. Let my words, Lord, not, not be just my words. Let them be your words, Jesus, your heart. Let us hear you this morning, Jesus, that your name be glorified in yours alone. And in Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen. Praise the Lord. So it was Helen Keller who said, life is either a daring adventure or it's nothing at all. And those words would ring true no matter who said it. But consider who Helen Keller was, it's pretty amazing. If you know who Helen Keller, and most of you do, at the age of 19, she had an illness come over her that took her sight and took her ability to hear. But yet... In her life, she was able to come out of that darkness and into the world around her. And her story is one of the greatest miracles of the 20th century. And millions of people have drawn inspiration from her. When you take this observation into the spiritual realm, it might look something like this. The life of faith is inherently a life of risk. Go back to the Bible and take a look at the men and women who did great things for God. Almost without exception, they were risk takers, and they didn't mind laying it all on the line 
for God. Let's consider these. Noah built an ark far away from any body of water, and there was no rain. And he could not see the end of the purpose. And for years, I'm sure he withstood a lot of ridicule, a lot of ridicule. But he believed in God, and he, in faith he did this. Abraham, who left his home and everything, the Bible says, not knowing where he was going, but his faith said, yes, Lord, I'll go. I'll go. Moses, who led all the people out of Egypt for God, not knowing really where he was going, out into a desert. Can I tell you, I got thinking about that. I'm like, when my kids were little, I couldn't lead them through Walmart. <laughs> I mean, it was like herding cats. So I can't imagine what it was like for him to do this. But he trusted God for it. Joshua marched around the walls of Jericho with some really unusual ways of taking a city. He couldn't see how this was going to work, but he trusted God and obeyed him. David faced Goliath and defeated him when nobody else would. He said, here am I. I'll do it. Elijah faced down the prophets of Baal. And that's one of my favorite stories. That's a great story. Esther risked her life to save her people. She had no idea what was going to happen when she stepped into that throne room. When you read the Bible again and again and again, you discover that the men and women who accomplished great things for God weren't content to just accept the status quo. Oh, no. They thought that more can be done if only someone would step out and lead the way. And when nobody else stepped forward, guess what they did? Hear my Lord, send me. That takes faith, great faith. And that is only right and proper because the life of faith is inherently a risk. And if you're unwilling to take a chance, you can never discover really what living by faith is all about. If you have to have all the answers, if you have to know exactly what's going to happen step by step by step, I'm afraid faith is always going to be a mystery to you. So this morning, I want to take a little time and talk to you about stepping out of your boat. This morning's message, again, is from Matthew 14, and it's about the story of Peter. I can't think really a, a, about a better story about stepping out in faith than Peter. And every, everyone knows this story. It's very beloved. And we've heard it many times over and over, and we never grow tired of it. The background of the story is really pretty simple. Jesus is on the northwestern shore of the Sea of Galilee, and it's really late in the day. And Jesus, in fact, is going on into evening. And Jesus had just performed the great miracle of the feeding the 5,000 plus, because we know there were a lot more people there than 5,000, with the five loaves and two fishes. And, and it was an astounding miracle. I mean, understandably, think about this. This all these people, this mass of people, they had just seen this great miracle. And they had to been so excited and so wound up about it. And, and I'm sure the disciples were too. They had to been so happy and praising God for what had just happened. But despite the excitement, the Bible tells us that Jesus insisted that they leave right away. Look at verse 22 out of Matthew 14. Immediately afterwards, he compelled the disciples to get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he sent the crowds away. Now, notice that it says Jesus compelled them to go. In other words, it's, it was urgent. You have to go. You have to go. So why was that important? That, that word intrigued me. I mean, it sounds, makes it sound like they weren't willing to go. They really didn't want to leave. And think about how it happened. They're in this crowd who are excited and happy. And understandably, I'd want to hang out with them too. I, I wouldn't want to really leave right away after that. And it just makes sense. They wanted to linger in that joy of the moment. But John's account of this tells us that the crowd was so enthusiastic, they wanted to actually take hold of Jesus and make him their king right there in that moment, right now. Can I say that, aren't you grateful that Jesus makes 
moves us out of the way of danger just at the right time. Sometimes we don't even know he's doing it. The disciples were in danger of being swept up in this enthusiasm and the crowd's idea of who they wanted Jesus to be, but not truly who he was. And so, sadly, we see this happening in the world today. There's a lot of people out there trying to make Jesus in their own image instead of his image. And even more disturbing, we're seeing that creeping into the church as well today. So Jesus tells the disciples they needed to leave immediately, and he went up to the mountain to pray. Verses 23 and 25. After he had sent the crowds away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And when it was evening, he was there alone. But the boat was already a long distance from the land, battered by the waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. Jesus had now sent the crowds away. His disciples had went away, and he was up in the mountain praying. Now, it's interesting to note the detail Mark puts into his account of this in Mark 6, 48. It says that Jesus was seeing them straining at the oars. Jesus sees them. How does he see them? John 6, 19 says that they had rowed about three or four miles out. So it wasn't like the boat was right there at the shore. They were three to four miles out. Set up the scene. Jesus is on the mountain. It's night. There's a storm, so it's probably raining. The guys are out three to four miles. How did he do that? He, the thing is, he saw them straining at the oars. That tells me that he saw them as individuals. He could see each one of them pulling at it. He could see their frustration. So you know what? That fills me with hope because that tells me that he sees me individually. No matter what I'm doing, no matter what's happening to me, he sees me. The Lord never takes his eyes off you. Proverbs 521 tells us, for the ways of a man are before the eyes of the Lord and he watches all his path. You know, he doesn't need glasses like I do. He doesn't need a magnifying glass. He doesn't need better lighting like I do anymore. He doesn't need cataract surgery. His vision of you and me is crystal clear. And he sees you regardless of your situation. What does the Psalms tell us whether I go to the mountain or to the depths of the sea? You are with me. You are with me. Praise God. That excites me. And remember that the situation of the disciples, they find themselves, was initiated by Jesus. He told them to go out into the boat and head out to sea. Now, some of these disciples were fishermen, and they're very well acquainted with the sea. They're very well acquainted with the storms that come up in the sea. And so they were reluctant to go, but they probably felt, eh, okay, I'm, pre I'm pretty well to use this. You know, this assignment's going to be easy. You know, no big deal. They didn't need Jesus to do it. <laughs> and they could rely on their own strength and their own expertise to get to the other side. Ministry was new, and so they really needed Jesus for that. That was unfamiliar, but, but the sea, yeah, we've got this. Can you look at each other and go, yeah, they got that. Yeah, at least they thought they did. Praise God. But only a few miles out, the Bible says the wind picked up and the waves got stronger. Anybody ever been out on water when a storm came up? You know how that is? Sometimes you can't even see which direction you're supposed to go to get back to shore. So they drew stronger, and then pretty soon they're pushing against that pull of the oars. It's getting harder and harder. The wind's blowing the opposite direction. And this was going to add hours to the trip that normally wouldn't take that long. Here it is. It's in the evening, so here comes 11 p.m., and here comes midnight and 1 a.m. They're still rowing. It's still raining. It's 2 
it's three, and still the storm continues with no sign of letting up. And after several exhausting hours, the disciples were stuck in the middle of the sea, and they were dirty, and they were drenched. I'm sure they were chilled to the bone, weary to the point that they begin to wonder if they're ever going to make it to the other side alive. Someone commented that at this rate, Jesus would probably beat them there on foot. That's how long it was taking. Suddenly, they realized their strength and their expertise wasn't going to be enough. They needed some help. Sometimes, God sends storms into our lives. Amen? But keep in mind that when he does, he always, always has a purpose for it. And sometimes it's the Lord's purpose is correction. We get off course. Think about Jonah and what happened to him. He had hopped on a boat, had in the opposite direction where God wanted, and God sent a storm and some interesting transportation and got him back in the right direction. Sometimes the Lord's purpose is for our spiritual growth, to increase our faith. The Lord will use a storm to help us grow and mature in our spiritual walk with Jesus. Remember what Paul said in Romans 5, 3, and 4. We rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. And perseverance produces character. And character produces hope. Is there anyone in here besides me that needs some hope in some situations we're praying for this morning? That's what hope is. That's the hope we're looking for this morning. And I believe Jesus was positioning his disciples to see him in a totally different way. One they had never seen him before in a way they really needed to see him. And that's what the Lord wants to do with us this morning to see him like we've never seen him because he has greater things than you can possibly imagine for you to do. So Jesus sees him out there in the storm struggling. And verse 25 says, And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. Why did Jesus need to go out to them? If he's on the mountain and he has the ability to see them three to four miles out, if he has the ability to feed 5,000 plus people, why did he need to go out there? Because he could have just spoke the word and the storm could have stopped. Can I tell you this? That Jesus Christ is not a distant savior. Oh no, he's a very personal savior. He's a very one-on-one -on -one Savior. He doesn't just see us at a big group. He sees you and you and you. He's very one-on-one. -on -one. He's a very present help in times of trouble. And Jesus was about to teach his disciples a very, very important lesson about who he was. And he would use the storm to do so. Now, it says that Jesus went to them in the fourth watch of the night. Well, what is the fourth watch? The fourth watch is defined by the Roman watch as a time spanning from 3 a.m. to 6 p.m. And biblically, strategic events have taken place during this time of the night and early morning hours. For example, Jacob wrestled with God. And met him face to face just before entering into his destiny as Israel. Moses led the Israelites across the Red Sea. God sent a wind to blow all night. The angels appeared to the shepherds in the field to announce the birth of the Savior. Jesus is resurrected from the dead in those hours. I feel it's no accident that Jesus goes out on the water to the disciples in the fourth watch because a powerful truth was about to be revealed that would change them forever. So now Jesus is walking on the water to his disciples, and verse 26 says, when the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified and said, it is a ghost, and they cried out in fear. 
Just then, someone shouted, what's that? Here is the storm. They're rowing, and all of a sudden, in the middle of it, there's like, Peter, what is that coming toward us over there? you got to think about I don't know about how you, how you read these stories and think about them and meditate. I'm always thinking I'm in the boat with them. And what am I thinking? What am I feeling? So that's like I would do the same. What's that? <laughs> they all looked back, and it was a person. At least they thought it was a person. It was kind of shaped like a person. Someone was walking or floating across the sea to them. And so when the disciples first see Jesus coming at them, they mistake him for a ghost because the sailors at that time had a lot of superstitions of the, uh, uh, the spirits of dead sailors would come and they were going to haunt them. So they had a lot of superstitions. Now they have spent the night rowing in a storm the whole time. They thought they were going to drown. And now a ghost shows up. I mean... What next? It's like, you know, things are going from bad to worse. It's like, you know, you go from the frying pan out into the fire. I mean, the, de the disciples were filling in the blanks at this point. I don't know what's going on here. And they see a figure walking on the water toward them, and they assume it must be a ghost. Can I say, isn't that just like us sometimes? It really is. We often make our fears greater than what they really are. And, but we can understand their fear, can't we? We're human. We're all human in here, right? And they were human. And they've been rowing and rowing and rowing and getting nowhere, and they can't seem to make it to shore. And it's sometime between 3 and 6 in the morning, and they're dead tired. Every muscle aches. The wind keeps howling. The rain's pelting them. And they are cold and tired and waterlogged and frustrated. They were trying to get where Christ has commanded them to go but are finding it difficult to do it. Don't we find the same thing sometimes? We're, when we're trying to be obedient to Christ, but suddenly we're straining at the oars. We're trying to do what the Lord asks us to do, but there's resistance. There's this resistance, and maybe that resistance is the displeasure of other people or differences of opinion, personality conflicts. Maybe we're trying to swim against the prevailing ideas of our culture or traditions. Maybe it's fatigue or circumstances that seem to be out of control. Or maybe the resistance is in us, in us. Maybe we are content to merely stay in the boat it's familiar. It's something we know. For some, we have chosen a destination and a goal and forgotten that the ultimate destination or goal is to draw closer to Jesus. We have forgotten our goal. We have forgotten our mission. Suddenly, someone sees this figure walking on the water. And I think in that situation, I would say exactly the same thing it's a ghost. I, my first thought would not be, well, here comes Jesus. He decided to walk on the water in the middle of the storm. I think I would be saying, guys, I know we've been rowing, but you need to row faster the opposite direction. <laughs> Go. But just then a familiar voice called to them, verse 27. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, take courage. It is I. Do not be afraid. Jesus? It sure sounded like Jesus, but no. He's, he's walking on the water. Maybe a spirit could do that, but people can't. I mean, everybody had to have been speechless at that point, like, Jesus? Sometimes we don't recognize Jesus in our situation because we are too focused on what we're experiencing. Often we are blinded to the presence of Jesus because of our expectations of him are so radically different than the reality of who he is and what he wants to do in our lives. The disciples focused on keeping the boat afloat, and they weren't expecting Jesus to show up walking on the water. Verse 28, Peter responded and said to him, 
Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Now notice that Peter verifies it's the Lord by asking permission to come to him. And this is a very important lesson for us. Make sure that the voice you are hearing inviting you to step out of your boat and into places that might be dangerous is the Lord's or not. There's a lot of other voices trying to get you to step out in dangerous places and will lead you in the wrong direction. And it might look really good. It might look great, but it's not the Lord's will or plan for you. And sometimes it's our own voice. It's our own voice. Thinking God told us to do something when in reality it's our own will and our own desire to do it. Sometimes it's the voice of others encouraging you to do a particular thing, but you never heard from the Lord about it. In fact, you never took it to the Lord and asked him about it. The enemy, folks, is always appealing to our flesh and our ego and our pride and our desire to do things our own way. The enemy is always unrelenting in this. And all that does is lead us to crash and burn. Make sure the one extending the invitation to step out of your boat and walk on water is Jesus. It's Jesus. Now, we must not miss the force of Jesus' words. When he said, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid, he used an expression the disciples would immediately have understood. The phrase, it is I, is the Greek version of God saying in Exodus that his name is I am. Jesus links himself here with the God who in the Old Testament miraculously delivered his people again and again and again. It's not just Jesus saying, don't worry, it's, it's me, I'm not a ghost. It's his way of saying, I am the Lord God of the universe. I created the wind and the waves. I sent the storm. He was showing them his divinity in this moment. And it is the Lord himself who tells Peter, come, walk on the water. Verse 29. And that's what he said. He said, come. And Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came toward Jesus. Once Peter was fully on the water, I, I was thinking about this little boat, boat is rocking. Their boat's getting rocked right now. The waves, and I got to think about Peter stepping out of that boat, you know. He, he's probably gripped that side pretty tight before he put that first step out. I'm like, oh, it's, it's solid, okay. So I think I can get out of the boat, you know. And so he puts that other leg, and he, he stands on the water. And as he walks toward Jesus, his master's walking toward him. What a vision of that. Everything goes fine until Peter notices the storm all around him. And, and remember, the storm hasn't stopped. Nothing has changed. During all this commotion, the rain has been coming down in sheets. And behind him, that little fishing boat is just bobbing every which direction on these waves. And verse 30 says, but seeing the wind, he became frightened. And when he began to see, sing, he cried out, Lord save me but the wind was there all along and the storm had been raging for hours it's not as if it led up when Jesus began walking on the water and sometimes when Jesus comes walking into our storm we we won't realize it and the storm won't quit Jesus comes to them in the midst of the storm and Jesus still meets us in our storms today he meets us in them so we understand his power and his authority over any situation you might be facing in here this morning. He meets us in the storm to show us that he is always with us and he has compassion on us. And even when it seems we can't find him 
anywhere. In his sermon on this passage, Robert Rayburn defines faith as concentration on Jesus. That's a great definition. I, I'm going to keep that definition. I find that very helpful because we can all get distracted, especially when the storms rage around us. Life throws a lot of stuff at us. Amen? And we don't ever see it coming for most part. It's not easy to keep your eyes on Jesus in the middle of the night when the raging storm of fear threatens to overwhelm you or grief. This text reminds us that not only does Christ control the storm, not only does he send the storm, he reveals himself in the midst of the storm. Very often our purest vision of Christ comes when the storms of life threaten to capsize our tiny little boat of faith. What do we do then? We pray for that concentrating faith. Lord, let me just keep my eyes on you. Focus on Jesus. It's like that old song we sing to fix your eyes on Jesus. For a brief moment, he forgets about Jesus and remembers who he is and where he is. He is Peter, a Galilean fisherman who belongs back in the boat. And in that instant, he looks down at his feet and he sees nothing but water underneath. And his mind comes to a quick conclusion. I'm no, not supposed to be walking on water. This is impossible. And when he lost his concentration on Jesus, he began to sink. And once Peter was outside the safety of the boat, out on uncharted waters, everything starts feeling a little bit precarious. Why? Well, think about it. People don't actually walk on water. I mean, it, it's, you know... We don't think about that. We're, we're so used to the story. We really don't think about the, the, how ridiculous that really is. Because this story we've heard a thousand times. It doesn't hit us. But let me tell you, it sure hit Peter in that moment. And he started to sing. Have you ever noticed, though, in this story that Peter the rock didn't sink like a rock? Anybody been on vacation and jumped off a dock off into a lake or maybe jumped in a deep swimming pool? What happens when you jump in? You sink immediately. You don't begin to sink. You just go straight under. That's it. There's something very profound going on here in this moment. Peter began to sink when his faith shifted from the firmness of Jesus' word to the in ability of his circumstances and his abilities himself. And when he did, it was Jesus that let him sink slowly, slowly. And for Peter, that was really a grace. Why? Because Peter's sinking produced his cry to Jesus. It quickly got Peter to stop looking to the world or to himself as the source of truth, his strength, and salvation, and instead cry out to his Savior. And as he goes down into the water, he prays one of the, the shortest but most powerful prayers that can ever be prayed in all the Bible. Lord, save me. Ah, in this case, the brevity was the course of wisdom because when you're about you're sinking, you don't have a lot of time to pray or you're going to drown. If you aren't quick about it, you're going to be all the way under. But that's okay. Romans 10, 13 says, whoever will call on the Lord, name of the Lord shall be what? He's going to be saved. That's all you have to do. And that's all you have to do this morning. Whatever your circumstance is, folks. The Bible says that immediately Jesus reached out his hand and he caught him. His words to Peter are very important. Verse 31, immediately Jesus reached out with his hand and he took hold of them and he said to him, 
you of little faith, why did you doubt? Now, in our English version of this, you of little faith comes out as four words. But in the Greek, Jesus only uses one word, little faith. It's a title or a nickname. Jesus called Peter little faith. Little faith, why did you doubt? When Jesus called Peter little faith, he wasn't rebuking Peter for attempting too much, but for trusting too little. Do you see the difference there? Jesus is not saying, Peter, you should have stayed in the boat. No, Jesus did not rebuke Peter for getting out of the boat. To the contrary, Jesus is really saying, Peter, if you would have just kept your eyes on me, we could have walked all the way over to the other side. And that's what he's saying to us this morning. If you just keep your eyes on me, we can walk together across the Atlantic Ocean. Keep your eyes on me. Keep your eyes on me. Matthew 19, 26 says, And looking at them, Jesus said to them, With people, ah, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. What are the all things you're going to believe God for this morning? Finally, verse 32, when they got into the boat, the wind stopped, and those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, you are truly God's son. And when Jesus and Peter got back into the boat, the disciples worshipped him. Now, we get the feeling that this worship was a little different than it had ever been before. Amen? I'm sure it was a whole lot different. And amazingly, this isn't the first time of this scenario where they're in a storm in a boat. <laughs> we see this earlier in Matthew 8. The storm was so bad, they think they're going to die. Only instead of walking on the water, Jesus is asleep in the boat. He's already there. And disciples wake Jesus, and he speaks to the wind and the waves, and the storm calms. Now, the disciples look at one another, and this is what they say. What kind of man is this? Even the winds and the sea obey him. Compare that to what they say in this moment, in this time. Now they say that Jesus is the Son of God. Now Jesus has got them to see who he really is, who they needed to know he was. How did they get from what kind of man is this till you're the son of God? Something about that experience opened their eyes to the power and ability of Jesus. Before this encounter, Jesus was just an amazing man. But now the disciples saw him as the Messiah, the son of God. So I ask you this morning, who is Jesus to you this morning? Who is he to you this morning? Is he just a name on a page when you read the Bible or do your devotional? Is he just a good person? He's just a great teacher? Or is he who Isaiah looked at the Lord as? High and lifted up. <laughs> and his train fills the temple. Who is your Jesus this morning, God, it's going to make all the difference in your situation that you're in right now. Who is Jesus to you? Stand with me this morning. I'm going to close. And I'm going to do something a little different. I'm going to go ahead and open these altars right now. Finally, I will close with this. Before you come down too hard, on Peter for taking his eyes off Jesus. Just remember that there were 11 other guys in the boat watching this whole affair. Before you sink, you've got to be out on the water. As long as you stay in the boat, you'll never sink, that's true, but you'll also never walk on water. This isn't the story of Matthew walking on water because Matthew stayed in the boat this isn't the story about James walking on the water because he stayed in the boat 
Maybe some of the others wanted to. Maybe they would have if Peter would have stayed out there longer. But give the man credit. He did it, and they didn't. That's why the story is about him. And the other 11 aren't even mentioned. For you see, all of us are in a boat. As I look across this congregation, we're all on a boat. Our names are on the boat. This morning, the Lord Jesus has shown up in somebody's fourth watch. He's wanting to do the miraculous. He's wanting to change your chaos and your darkness with an invitation to step into your destiny that he has for you this morning. He has come during the fourth watch of your night, the time when angels are dispatched and the Holy Spirit is moving for the miraculous. We are in the world's fourth watch. Can I say that? That minutes from the return of Jesus and he's telling us, now isn't the time to play it safe, folks. Now is the time to get out of your boat and so I can empower you to walk on the water with me but you have to get out of the boat if you're experiencing some stormy seas right now and chaos and the waves are crashing over your boat praise God because Jesus is extending you an invitation with that say come come it's time to step out of your boat and out into the water with them stop step out of your complacency Maybe it's a boat of bitterness and unforgiveness. Step out of your boat of fear and doubt. And maybe it's a sinful lifestyle. And into his purpose for you this morning. Maybe this morning, like Peter, you heard Jesus and you did step out of your boat. But somewhere along the way, you lost sight of Jesus. And perhaps you started thinking you could do it all on your own. And instead of drawing the strength from Jesus, you start trying to make it work on your own. And things have become complicated and confusing and exhausting. And you're sinking right now. If this is you, I have such good news for you. All you have to do is call on the name of Jesus. Save me. And he's going to reach down and just pull you up. There'll be no rebuke, anything like that. He's not disappointed. He's going to pull you up. Here we go. Here we go. And underneath are those everlasting arms. What's your story going to be this morning? That's what the Lord is asking the Holy Spirit. I feel it so strongly. What is going to be your story? The Lord is calling you out to deeper things, to the miraculous and to new territories with you, church. He's calling the church, he's calling this church to step out of your boat and walk on the water with him because I've got things for you to do. I've got the miraculous things for you to do. There are still lost out there. The time is growing short. You need to step out of your boat, church, and fling yourself into his cause and his mission. Are you going to step out onto the waters with Christ, or are you going to play it safe and stay in the boat? I realize that it's risky walking on water. It's possible that you might sink, but you'll never know until you get out of the boat. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus, what you're doing right now. Thank you, Lord. Help us, Jesus. Lord Jesus, help us to step out of our boats this morning. God, help us, Lord. You know who needs to be released and let go of and find freedom in walking in the water. You've been calling some people, Jesus, for a long time. A long time in their fear they have resisted you, Jesus. Release freedom in here, Lord, that we can walk on the water with you this morning. Praise you, God. Thank you.